In the letter of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, while writing to the people in the church in the city of Corinth, which is located in the southern part of Greece, as he was reflecting on the ministry that the Lord had entrusted to him, the apostle Paul recalled the many difficulties that he had endured along the way for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many times he had been under great pressure, afflicted beyond measure, yet he had not been crushed by those afflictions. How at times he had been overwhelmed by the circumstances around him, where he was at a loss, unable to find any way out, not knowing which way to turn. Yet, he was not driven to hopelessness. He did not give up in despair. And though he had been hunted down like an animal for his faith, the Lord had never abandoned him. Even when he had been struck down to the ground, it was the Lord who sustained him. He may have been knocked down, but he was never knocked out. He was victorious, not by escaping suffering, but he was victorious by enduring it through the grace, through the strength of God, so that the life of Christ might be made manifest in him as it will be made manifest in all of us who live to glorify our Savior. And as Paul wrote these words to the church in Corinth, to other churches as well, I believe that he certainly had in mind his time that he spent in Philippi, a city in the northern part of Greece where the Lord used some very intense circumstances, and he turned those circumstances into a great spiritual victory. You will recall that as Paul and his co-workers for Christ, Silas and Timothy and Luke, arrived in the city of Philippi, they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to a group of women who were worshiping down by a river outside of the city. And one of those women, a woman named Lydia, believed the message of salvation along with her entire household. And so, we read, the church in Philippi was born. And these new believers met in her house. But the enemy was quick to react by attempting to infiltrate that little fellowship of believers through a demon-possessed slave girl who used those satanic powers, who was used by him, to convince the people that the words that she spoke were divinely inspired when in fact they were really the words of demons. And so we're told she was bringing her masters much profit, great wealth by her fortune telling. And she continually followed Paul and his co-workers around the city identifying herself, attempting to identify herself with the servants of God and with the message of salvation. But, we are told, through the power of God, Paul commanded those demons to come out of her, and it says they came out of her at that very moment. They were gone. And so Satan was hindered in his attempt to infiltrate the church. But, sometimes when he can't infiltrate the church, he changes his tactics, and he attempts to persecute it. 
And so it says in verse 19 of Acts chapter 16, that when the masters, the owners of that slave girl, saw that she had been released from the oppression of that demonic possession. They did not rejoice, but instead they became angry. Why? Because they saw that their hope of profit had gone away along with those demons. They were upset because of the loss of income. And that should speak to our hearts as well. Our preoccupation in the pursuit of money or the things that money can buy can sometimes cloud our vision and influence us in a bad way. So we're told these men seized Paul and Silas Epi lambanomai in Greek. They violently grabbed a hold of them and we're told they dragged them, helkuo, they dragged them by the heels. They dragged them into the marketplace, the agora, the place where people gather together to buy and to sell, the place where business was conducted. The place where the local government officials met to administer the law of Rome. So these businessmen dragged Paul and Silas before the local authorities and they brought them, we are told, to the chief magistrates, strategos in Greek, to two governors who were responsible for maintaining order in that city. They presented their case before them. These men who had suffered this financial loss without the, the services of this slave girl. And so they said to the officials, these two men that we have brought before you, they are throwing our city into confusion. Etarasso in Greek. They're disturbing the peace. They're agitating the people. They are causing disorder among us, being Jews, being foreigners from a different culture, who do not respect, who do not value our way of life. And so, they are proclaiming and advocating customs, ethnos in Greek, a way of life that is not lawful, that is not permissible for us to accept or to receive as our own or to observe, to believe, being Romans. We are Romans, and since under Roman law, no Roman citizen can follow any religion unless it has been approved by the Senate in Rome, they are in violation of that law. So, solely on the word of these slave owners, the crowd who had assembled in that marketplace, rose up together, sunafistemi in Greek. They were united in their outrage against Paul and Silas. And not only were they outraged, but we're told the magistrates were caught up in the frenzy of the crowd, and they tore the robes off of Paul and Silas. They stripped them of their garments, exposing their backs. And then, it says, they proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. Rabdidso in Greek, to be struck repeatedly with a bundle of sticks that were used for that purpose of this brutal punishment. Punishment that was administered by two men called lictors, who were experts in inflicting pain. And we're told in verse 23, when they had 
inflicted them with many blows, plague in Greek, with wounds, with wounds too numerous to count, a violent assault against them, upon them, shredding their flesh into pieces. After that, we're told, they threw them into the prison house, commanding the jailer, desmophulax in Greek, instructing the keeper of bonds to guard them securely, asphalos in Greek, safely, without fail, or else he would pay with his life for his failure. And so, it says, having received such a stern command from these magistrates, realizing or understanding that these two prisoners were extremely dangerous, we are told he threw them into the, the inner room, the place of maximum security, chaining them in that dungeon where there was no light, where there was no outside air, only filth and rats and lice, no sanitary conditions, with no food, with no water. And as an added precaution, we're told this jailer fastened their feet. He secured them in stocks, zulon, tying their ankles to a piece of wood, a device designed to stretch their legs to induce unbearable cramping and pain. But though their backs were torn wide open, and though they were bruised and bleeding, at about midnight, it says in verse 25, Mesa Nuktion in Greek, somewhere in the middle of the night, Paul and Silas were praying. They were lifting up their voices to God, even in the midst of such great opposition, even in the midst of their pain. What were they doing? We are told they were singing hymns of praise to God, perhaps with words that, like we find in Psalm 95, where it says, Oh, come, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully with psalms. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. We are the sheep of his hand. Their persecution, their pain, had resulted in praise. A lesson there for us as well. So, they believed that they had been found worthy to suffer. They had been found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. He had suffered for them. He had suffered in shame and in agony and in pain and in contempt. What a privilege for them to suffer for him, to join him in that kind of fellowship. Perhaps a thought that is foreign to many today who named the name of Jesus. And we're told the sound of their voices echoed throughout the entire prison house because we're told in verse 25, the other prisoners who were also chained in their cells could hear them. They were listening to them. Epa kroaomai in Greek. They were listening intently taking in these words, these praises to God, being comforted by them, being encouraged by what they heard. 
These are things that many of them may have never heard before, and certainly not in a situation like that. What a testimony to the grace of God in the lives of Paul and of Silas. A testimony that we have the opportunity to give in the midst of our suffering and our difficulties. They didn't let their problems alter their beliefs. They knew that despite the situation, despite the problems, despite the pain, the Lord was still in control of their situation, so they did not lose heart, but they confidently entrusted themselves to the Lord, to his care. What a lesson for us. And we're told suddenly, verse 26, without warning, these songs of praise were interrupted. The Lord was about to intervene on behalf of his two servants. So it says without warning, there came upon the prison house, not upon the entire city, but upon the prison house, a great earthquake, seismos in Greek, a violent shaking. The earth beneath the prison house began to shake with such force that the foundations, the rocks upon which the prison house was built, were shaken out of place. Saliuo in Greek. They were tossed around like debris in the wind. Sometimes it does take an earthquake of some kind in our lives to get our attention, and this earthquake got the attention of everybody in that prison house. And immediately it says, verse 26, para crema, in an instant, the entire situation was changed. And all the doors of the prison cells were opened. And noigo, they were broken wide open, and everyone's chains were un fastened. And when the jailer had been roused, when he, when he woke up out of sleep because of the earthquake, we're told he saw that the prison doors were opened. He knew that he would be held responsible for the escape of those prisoners. He felt that his life was over. His world had just been shaken and turned upside down. So rather than face a humiliating and a painful execution, which is what would have awaited him, we're told he drew his sword, his makaira, his dagger, and he was about to kill himself. Supposing, no mead so, logically thinking that all of the prisoners had escaped, ek fugo in Greek, that they had fled to safety, which I suppose is a reasonable assumption. Not realizing, not understanding that without Christ, his death would bring him into an even worse situation, that he would be unable to escape forever. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ, facing death without Christ is like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. The results will be catastrophic. But, we're told, at that very moment, from out of the darkness, Paul cried out to him, and with a loud voice he said, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. No one has fled. Amazed, amazed at what had just taken place, the, the jailer called to one of his assistants for lights for torches to be brought to him, and then we're told he rushed, is 
pedao in Greek, he leaped forward into the cell of Paul and Silas and trembling, entramos, shaking with fear, with terror, he fell down, prospipto, he fell down, face down on the floor of that cell and he trembled before Paul and Silas. Surely these were men of God. Surely these were men who spoke the truth. Surely they were messengers of the one true God, the God of the universe. And so we're told in verse 30, after he brought them out into the courtyard of the prison house, he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How do I get right with God? He expressed the longing of an empty heart. A question that we all need to ask before we die, before it is too late. And they said to him simply, believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Believe with all your heart that he is the Christ, that he is the only way to be delivered from the wrath to come. Trust that the work of Jesus on the cross has paid for your sins and you shall be saved. Sodzo in Greek, you will be made spiritually well and whole. You and your whole household will be saved if you will believe. And then we're told Paul and Silas spoke the word of the Lord to him, explaining more fully the plan of salvation, speaking to him, we're told, together with all who were in his household. They had a meeting somewhere near the prison, and we're told they all believed. They all believed. And then the first thing this jailer did, we're told, is that at that very hour, he washed their wounds. And immediately at once, it says, he was baptized. He and all of his household who had believed, publicly declaring their faith in Christ. What a change. This hard-hearted jailer had become a new creation. In Christ, he was now a child of God. And so he brought them into his house and he set food before them. And we're told he rejoiced greatly. He radiated with joy, having believed in God along with his entire household. What a story. But it says... In the morning, when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen to the prison. The same men who had beaten Paul and Silas the day before, saying to the jailer, release those men, Apaluo, set them free. And the jailer reported these words to Paul. And to Silas saying, the chief magistrates have sent word. They have given orders to release you. You've been pardoned. Therefore, come out of the prison and go in peace. Go with the blessing of God. But the problem, the question was this. What would happen after Paul and Silas were gone? What would happen after they left the city? Would others in the church at Philippi be subjected to the same kind of illegal ill treatment? A precedent needed to be established. So Paul said to them, 
they have beaten us and torn our flesh, humiliating us in public, and all this without a trial, which is illegal under Roman law. And we are men who are Romans. We are Roman citizens with rights as citizens. And they have even thrown us into prison without a trial, another violation of Roman law. They are in danger of losing their positions as magistrates or even of losing their lives if this incident finds its way back to Rome. And the city of Philippi could even lose its status as a Roman colony. There could be grave consequences, far-reaching consequences for their actions. So now, Paul said, are they sending us away secretly, Lathra, to escape notice without anyone knowing about it? No, he says. No, indeed. But let them come here to this prison house. Let them come here themselves and let them bring us out. And the policemen, the lictors, reported these words of Paul to the chief magistrates. And we're told in verse 38, they were afraid. Phobeo, they were terrified. They were terrified when they heard that Paul and Silas were Romans, citizens of Rome. And so they came to the prison house themselves and we're told they appealed to Paul and to Silas how things had changed. And when they brought them out of their cells, they kept begging them. They kept pleading with them to leave the city. And when Paul and Silas went out of the prison, they entered the house of Lydia where the church had begun to meet. And when they saw the brethren, the brothers and sisters in Christ who were there, we are told that they encouraged them to be strong in the Lord. We may be knocked down, but we will never be knocked out. And then we're told they departed from the city of Philippi perhaps leaving Luke there in the city for a time to minister to them. So like Paul and Silas, like that jailer, we who know Christ can rejoice. We have every reason to rejoice. We can rejoice in all things, even in the midst of suffering, because we may be knocked down. But in Christ, we will never be knocked out. So, again I say, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always, both now and forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.